Yes. <laughs> so it is a really great pleasure and my apologies for uh, the technical problems here to introduce uh, today's uh, um, Lane Lecture uh, Grand Rounds uh, speaker, Dr. John Varga. Uh, Dr. Varga uh, obtained his MD degree from the New York University School of Medicine in 1980, uh, proceeded to an uh, internship and residence in medicine uh, at Rhode Island Hospital, which is part of Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, then a rheumatology fellowship at the uh, uh, University School of Medicine in Boston, and then a postdoctoral uh, research fellowship uh, supported by a T32 grant uh, from 85 to 87. He then uh, became uh, an assistant professor at the Jefferson Medical College um, of, of uh, Thomas Jefferson University uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where um, he was promoted to associate professor in 92, and then uh, he moved in, in uh, 95 uh, to the University of Illinois in Chicago uh, to become a professor of medicine, where he um, uh, transferred to uh, the Northwestern University in uh, 2004, and then um, uh, became uh, a professor uh, first of uh, um, uh, medicine, uh, and then at dermatology and pharmacology, all at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. He um, moved to um, uh, University of Michigan, where he still is today in 2020, uh, uh, got an endowed professorship and uh, became the chief of rheumatology uh, at that time in 2020 having served actually uh, as a chief of rheumatology already uh, for a long time uh, in, in Chicago. So Dr. Varga uh, is uh, well-funded. He has uh, a very large number of awards. He's a master of the ACR. He's had, uh, had um, editorial positions. He's trained a very long list of uh, young uh, scientists and physicians. Um, he has been particularly active in the Scleroderma Foundation, um, and his research has focused to a very large extent on uh, Scleroderma, particularly in the recent uh, decades. He has a total of 430 scientific publications, a very respectable number, and there are many uh, seminal papers uh, in that uh, list of publications. And I'm going to hand it over to him to... Uh, uh, give us the grand rounds uh, uh, for the Lane lecture series uh, right now. He's going to come sit in my chair here. So you're w welcome, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Hello. I hope everyone can hear me. And uh, apologies for, for the uh, technical glitches, <clears throat> but delighted to be here and I probably shouldn't have had to wear my suit because we're doing this virtually. Um, here is my disclosures, and I'm going to give an update on some of our recent work on scleroderma and some of the work that's translationally relevant and might have uh, ultimately uh, therapeutic implications as well. <clears throat> and I just want to start with the key collaborators, members of my team, uh, and other key collaborators that we work with. The ones on blue are individuals who are postdocs or trainees and have now gone on to uh, do their own uh, work as well. So just by way of introduction, uh, some of the key features in scleroderma, this is a complex polygenic disease. Genetics is confusing because there is familiar clustering but low twin concordance. There's a strong sex bias, as is true for most autoimmune diseases. And there's a rather older age onset. <clears throat> there is a great deal of patient heterogeneity. And other than uh, hematopoietic stem cell therapy, there's really no effective treatment to date. And I really like this recent study from Ian McInnes using the UK Biobank data. <laughs> Um, where he looks at autoimmune diseases <clears throat> and the age of onset. And you can see 
<clears throat> that there is a very, very great variability in the age of onset of when these diseases start, with some really uh, throughout the lifespan, some are old age diseases, some are younger, and scleroderma is really, you can see, is, is really more the older age, suggesting that environmental factors perhaps are more important than the genetic risk in, in getting this disease. Now, importantly, what makes scleroderma rather unique is this tripartite pathogenesis where patients with the disease really have almost invariably all three of these processes of vasculopathy, autoimmunity, and fibrosis. And it's really rather unique in, in the constellation of these three processes occurring together. I'm not going to talk much about uh, the autoimmunity, not going to really talk much about the vascular part, but those are all very important features of the disease. But ultimately, it's fibrosis in multiple organs that leads to uh, high morbidity and mortality, great excess mortality, which is primarily due to pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary vascular hypertension which involves both vasculopathy and perivascular fibrosis. <laughs> now, thinking about fibrosis, there's been a lot of work over the last two, three decades in trying to understand what's going on here. And uh, an emerging way to think about fibrosis is that normally tissues are maintained by stable circuits. And these are typically cell-cell circuits, such as immune stromal cell circuits. We've long recognized that BNP cells and macrophages in the tissue send out uh, uh, proteins and other signals. I listed a few of the key ones here that signal other cells in a paracrine or just a crine or even autocrine manner to become activated. But there's also immune matrix stromal more complex circuits and a very nice recent paper on layer one which is an inhibitory receptor that is normally suppressed by collagen uh, on, on inflammatory cells but in situations when collagen is disordered dysregulated as in fibrosis this inhibitory receptor fails to respond and therefore by default activates neighboring fibroblasts and, and there are additional circuits emerging. There is a lot of interest in autocrine circuits, and some of these feature TGF-beta, the IL-6 family of cytokines, including LIF, oncostatin, and IL-11 in particular, seem to be very important in fibrosis. And all of these are targetable. <clears throat> and then there is interest in uh, extending this from cells to actually the matrix, so that there is a lot of evidence now that the matrix itself directly signals either to stromal cells and or macrophages. And this is done through both biochemical, biophysical, biomechanical signal transduction, all to normally regulate the homeostasis of, of uh, stromal tissues such as the skin and the lung. <clears throat> and you can see that whenever these circuits are disrupted, uh, it can lead to pathology. And I, I think the best example illustrating many of these circuits that sort of a, a natural process is, is what's now called fibroaging, the idea that with biological aging, all of our tissues really become stiffer and fibrotic. And then you can see that this then will trigger a variety of the kind of circuits that I mentioned where uh, either the stiff stroma or senescent cells or fibroinflammaging uh, inf inflammatory cells further stimulate the fibroblasts, which are the key effector cells here, and drive this persistent and progressive fibrosis. Now, <clears throat> a lot of this work was really speculative and correlative until the advent of single cell RNA sequencing and I was fortunate to partner up with Johan Goodjohnson at the University of Michigan, who's really done some of the nicest work, at least in terms of understanding the skin and the cellular composition. And this is a paper that we just published uh, last month, looking at uh, 22 scleroderma patients and, and uh, about 19 or 20 more or less age match controls. 
and trying to understand what are the cell-cell relationships and cell types that are seen in these skin biopsies. And this is just UMAP showing that we can identify about 12 distinct cell populations. And on the right, you can see that these actually uh, cluster pretty nicely between healthy and scleroderma, indicating that there are significant changes in these cell types as patients develop scleroderma. And this below is just showing the, the markers used to identify these cell types. We can also use a uh, spatial transcriptome. This is actually more the older technology uh, where each of these uh, pixels really can include multiple cell types. So not really necessarily that specific, but just indicating that there's a lot of fibroblasts, a lot of pericytes in the tissue, especially in the deeper dermis. And you can see that unlike some other autoimmune conditions, there's really a paucity of T cells, but we do see a reasonable number of myeloid cells throughout the, the dermis and particularly uh, around blood vessels. Now looking at the myeloid <clears throat> uh, processes in some more detail, this is a skin biopsy from a patient with scleroderma. And you can see the dramatic increase in the dermal thickness, also the loss of the dermal white adipose tissue, which I'll come back to later. And you can see these aggregates of mononuclear inflammatory cells that are seen typically in early scleroderma and tend to disappear as the, as the disease progresses. Mm -hmm. and, and looking at these uh, inflammatory vascular niches uh, and, and you know, with some data that I'm not really going to present, it seems that monocytes can leave the circulation, enter the tissue under the influence of, of chemokines and cytokines. And in the tissue, they undergo differentiation. One particular macrophage subset we are interested in is the Marco-positive uh, M2-like macrophages, which then signal to a resident fibroblast to convert them into myofibroblasts. These uh, myofibroblasts can be CCL19 positive, in other words, acting like inflammatory cells, and they also have high levels of the metabolic enzyme NNMT. And they themselves, again, then secrete chemokines and cytokines to further activate the macrophages, establishing a, a stable uh, uh, bicellular circuit that maintains fibrosis. And in a recent study, we showed that using nanoparticles, PLG nanoparticles, we can selectively target the Marco-positive macrophages, redirect them into the spleen where they undergo apoptosis. And this strategy seems to work very nicely in mouse models of scleroderma. Now, in earlier studies, we, before the advent of uh, single-cell RNA-seq, we use bulk RNA-seq, which actually has its own advantages so that while you can't identify individual cell types, you can see a, a more uh, global picture, larger data sets, uh, and, and a greater coverage of, of differentially expressed genes. And this is work done with Mike Whitfield and Monique Hinchcliffe, showing that in, in this case, each column is an individual patient. The reds are genes that are upregulated, and you can see a marked heterogeneity in these biopsies with about half the biopsies showing a lot of red and the genes that are upregulated in these biopsies are inflammatory genes and particularly genes in the innate immune signaling pathway. What's also interesting is in this paper, we looked at a lot of the skin biopsies from the same individuals. And we found that despite the presence of a highly inflammatory gene signature, there tends to be a paucity of uh, inflammatory cells in the tissue, suggesting that the inflammatory and innate immune signals might actually be coming from resident cells rather than uh, 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 professional immune cells. Now, this led us to think about innate immunity and toll-like receptor, and I have to give credit to Keith Alcon. Keith was the one who first really introduced me to the concept of innate immunity and toll-like receptors, 
But this is a concept that was nicely reviewed way back by Ruslan Medzitov and Janeway in 2000, showing that these innate immune signaling uh, receptors, such as toll-like receptor 4, activate intracellular signaling pathways, which then typically lead to uh, inflammatory responses. And they are recognized by microbial uh, motifs, such as uh, MAMPs. But it's become recognized that, in fact, very important ligand for the toll-like receptors is the endogenous ligands. And of course, uh, work here uh, has abundantly looked at the role of these endogenous and damage-associated ligands in autoimmunity. But in fact, these damage-associated ligands probably play a very important role in fibrosis as well. And so to try to understand what could be some of the signals that turn on uh, toll-like receptor signaling that we see in these scleroderma biopsies, we screen biopsies for known endogenous ligands of toll-like receptor 4, focusing on matrix-associated ligands. And essentially, what we found is that a number of large macromolecules that are normally part of the matrix, in particular, tenacin C and fibronectin EDA are two of them, are very highly upregulated in scleroderma biopsies. Now, normally, these molecules are expressed during embryonic development and wound healing, but otherwise, in normal, healthy adults, they are present at low levels. But we find that in, in fibrosis, as well as in tumors, these molecules are highly upregulated. And when we culture fibroblasts from patients with scleroderma, as shown in these lower panels, they actually make large amounts of these, uh, what, what has been called oncophetal or alternately spliced molecules that can act like ligands for toll-like receptors. And through a number of studies, we've shown that uh, there seems to be a pathway where the accumulation of large molecules such as fibronectin, EDA, tenacin C, and others activate toll-like receptors now in fibroblasts. And instead of a primarily autoimmune or inflammatory response, they actually trigger their transformation into activated myofibroblasts, which then lead to fibrosis. And, and interestingly, of course, these myofibroblasts themselves will then produce these alternately splice molecules, exa exaggerating the matrix accumulation and really setting up this vicious self-amplification loop. Now, <clears throat> Toll-like receptor signaling is very tightly regulated in order to prevent runaway or aberrant uh, chronic inflammation. And when, when this fails, you get uh, auto-inflammatory disease like Bechet's disease and others. And it's been shown many years ago that one of the key regulators of toll-like receptor signaling is a, is a molecule called A20, which is encoded by the gene TNF-AIP. P3. This is a gene that's very commonly altered, mutated, or lost in many autoimmune and inflammatory diseases, including scleroderma. On the right, I'm just showing the original discovery of A20 because this is Rory Marks, who's actually my neighbor at Michigan. And when he was a postdoc, he was treating monocytes with a number of inflammatory cytokines and found that this molecule called A20 that was not known was very highly upregulated, and this really became the original description of the A20 pathway with Vishwa Dixit. Now, A20 is commonly altered, and, and certainly in GWAS studies, it's a very strong association with scleroderma and other inflammatory diseases. So we've been interested in the role of A20 in, in the scleroderma context. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. We looked at the expression of A20 in, in scleroderma biopsies, and we find that it's generally reduced in level. And in fact, when we look at the protein level, we find that there's a loss of A20 in the fibroblast, and, and, and the fibroblasts that show myofibroblast phenotype have absent A20, suggesting an inverse correlation between a20, a negative regulator of inflammation, and the myofibroblast phenotype. And we can show this nicely 
uh, again, using cultured fibroblast, showing that a normal uh, scleroderma fibroblast uh, show high levels of, of um, um, loss of A20 and high levels of alternately spliced molecules such as fibronectin EDA, suggesting that the A20 might be playing a role in preventing this activation. To try to understand this more specifically, we wanted to look at knockout mice, mice that are lacking A20, but as been shown many years ago, these mice get a profound inflammatory disease and die at an early age. So to get around that, we generated A20 haploinsufficient mice, and these mice look healthy, but they have about 50% reduction in A20 levels, which really kind of mimics what we see in a lot of patients with scleroderma. Uh, and when we treat these mice with bleomycin, a low-dose bleomycin as our model for scleroderma, uh, we find that while wild-type mice develop scleroderma after a few weeks of bleomycin injection, in the A20 haploinsufficient mice, they get a much more severe uh, scleroderma phenotype, as you can see in these marked increase in dermal thickness. And this is even more pronounced in the lung. So low level of bleomycin in wild-type mice causes only a modest increase in scar formation at the pleural surface, but these mice really develop profound diffuse lung fibrosis with low-dose bleomycin, suggesting that A20 is really playing a protective role against fibrosis. Now, to understand what cells is it doing it, because A20 has been primarily studied in inflammatory cells, we generated a knockout where A20 is completely absent, but only in fibroblasts. And when we did our BLEO model, we found the same thing as we, as we saw with the uh, global haploinsufficient mice. That is that mice that lack A20 in their fibroblast develop more severe skin and lung fibrosis. <laughs> and so the hypothesis that we postulated is that uh, there's normally fibrotic signaling by ligands like TGF beta and WINS and many others. And these will lead to a transformation of resting fibroblast to myofibroblast. And a similar process actually happens with other stromal cells, including adipocytes and macrophages. Under the influence of uh, TGF beta, they become activated myofibroblasts. But A20 seems to be important in playing a, an inhibitory role in preventing these transitions. <clears throat> and when there's adequate levels of A20, the cells are protected from dedifferentiating into these activated myofibroblasts. And this leads to a number of potential therapeutic opportunities to try to enhance A20 activity in order to prevent fibrosis. <clears throat> Now, fibroblasts are the uh, critical cells driving all forms of fibrosis. So next, we went to focus on understanding the fibroblast population in the scleroderma biopsies. And we can see that in the population of cells that we call fibroblasts, there's actually distinct subsets, as shown here, characterized by different sets of, uh, of genes that are highly upregulated. And we classify these to about seven or eight different fibroblast subset as labeled here. And you can see that when we compare normal and scleroderma biopsies, again, they cluster quite differently. So for example, uh, these are primarily from healthy individuals. These are the SFRP2 fibroblasts. But these fibroblasts that are, for example, collagen 8 positive are only seen in scleroderma patients. So there seems to be a transition from these SFRP fibroblasts in healthy individuals to these activated collagen 8 positive fibroblasts in scleroderma patients. And in fact, in data that I won't show you, but using pseudo time analysis, we can provide supporting evidence that in fact, that seems to be happening, that these fibroblasts undergo a differentiation. We can also look at how these cells are distributed in the skin biopsies. And you can see that collagen-producing cells are noted throughout the fibrotic dermis. These are scleroderma biopsies. And we can define an ECM score, that is 
uh, fibroblasts that make a lot of matrix protein. And you can see, again, fairly diffusely distributed. And then there are these islands of very high producing fibroblasts. Interestingly, these are not the SFRP2 positive fibroblasts. Again, suggesting this idea that the SFRP2 is a marker for resting fibroblasts that are perhaps poised to become activated in the fibrotic process. One thing that we observed that was very interesting and novel is that the fibroblasts that make collagen aid are only seen in scleroderma patients. These are absent in healthy biopsies and they are situated primarily here in the deeper dermis. And this is a novel a fibroblast subset that we're very interested in understanding uh, where they come from and what they do. Now you can take these data further, and this is really the beauty of single cell RNA-seq data because now you can computationally begin to ask which cell is talking to which other cell and what are the signals and networks <clears throat> that are driving this uh, interaction. And one thing that's obvious when you look at these interactomes or connectomes is on the left is a healthy skin biopsy, on the right is scleroderma biopsy. And you can obviously see that there's a lot more cell-cell communications uh, compared to healthy controls, suggesting that these biopsies and these cells are all highly activated and are actively uh, signaling to each other. And you can also see that the major hub is actually the collagen 8 positive fibroblast. And the major communication is actually, and surprising, not really with myeloid cells, as has been thought earlier, but really with vascular cells. So various endothelial subpopulations seem to be in very active communication with the cell type. And these are very interesting interactions that we hope to uh, dig into deeper. You can look at it even more granularly by, by asking specifically which ligands on which cells are talking to which receptors on which cells. Um, and you can see many, many interactions. So again, it's a very active niche. Uh, but I highlighted some of the cytokines and, and signals that are well known to be involved in fibrosis. This is the uh, IL-6 family, the TGF-beta family, and others. And you can see that they crosstalk to a number of cells, most especially receptors that are expressed on the collagen-8 positive fibroblasts. Again, highlighting the importance of this cell-cell uh, uh, interaction that seems to underlie the fibrotic process. <laughs> now, um, this tells us a lot about fibroblast activation states and fibroblast crosstalk, but another important question in the field is where do these fibroblasts come from? And of course, now with um, single-cell RNA-seq, we can use uh, computational approaches, pseudo-time analysis, but historically this has been done really by observation and animal models using lineage tracing. And a lot of that work indicated that the main source of the pathological myofibroblast is probably just resting fibroblast. And now we know from the single cell RNA that a lot of these are these SFRP2 positive resting fibroblasts. But there are other cell types that might be progenitors to the myofibroblast. And there's a lot of data for endothelium, pericytes. But one thing we were interested in is the role of adipocytes as potential progenitors to myofibroblasts. And the rationale for thinking about adipocytes is that when we look at patients with scleroderma, they have a, a lipodystrophic type of appearance that even just by visual inspection and certainly by palpation, it feels like they have lost the dermal adipose layer that we all have that plays such an important role in regulating uh, heat loss and just thermal regulation in general. And indeed, if we do skin biopsies on patients with scleroderma, here's a healthy individual, the dermis, and a very generous uh, intradermal adipose layer that prevents heat loss. In patients with scleroderma, we, we progressively lost this adipose layer and is replaced by a collagen-rich collagen uh, scar. 
And you can do perilipin staining, and we see that the adipocytes in this layer become shriveled and dysregulated. And by trichome staining, we can see that the adipocytes now show abundant deposition of collagen and accumulation. So we were very interested in what, what is this process? What's driving it? What is its significance? Uh, and, and to address that, uh, Roberta Marangoni, who was a postdoc in the lab, uh, generated a transgenic mice where the uh, mature adipocytes are labeled with tomato red. So they're genetically labeled. And we can see that in normal mice, the adipose cells that are stained red and are co-stained with perilipin are restricted into this one niche, which is in the dermis, and it's a layer of white adipose tissue. When the mice are induced to develop scleroderma, we see that this uh, adipose layer essentially collapses. And now these labeled cells are migrating into the dermis. So these are adipocyte-derived cells and are staining for uh, alpha-smooth muscle actin, which is a marker of myofibroblasts. So they seem to have undergone a, a cell fate differentiation during this fibrotic process. And we can uh, actually reproduce this in vitro. So culturing normal human pre-adipocytes in the absence of TGF-beta, they show staining with adiponectin and perilipin, so they're typical adipocytes. But in, under the influence of TGF-beta, they lose these adipogenic markers, they make collagen, and they acquire these uh, typical stress fibers that are indicative of myofibroblasts. So essentially, what we propose is that there's a process called adipocyte mesenchymal transition, where resident uh, adipocytes uh, during the injury process undergo this differentiation to become myofibroblasts, migrate into the fibrotic tissue, and, and now drive and, and sustain the fibrotic process. Importantly, this is a highly reversible process. And when these uh, adipocyte-derived myofibroblasts are induced to stimulate adipogenesis with drugs like metformin, PPAR gamma agonists, or adiponectin, they can actually revert back to these uh, resting and non-fibrotic adipocytes. And this has now been shown in the, in, in the lung and other organs as well. So this seems to be a conserved uh, biological process. Now, adiponectin seems to be able to sort of rescue the myofibroblast uh, from their activated phenotype to go back into uh, adipogenic adipocytes. Uh, but adiponectin is a very difficult drug to work with because it tends to form these very complex large molecules. And nobody's really been able to successfully develop adiponectin for, for treatment. Um, what we've done is uh, look at a, a, a transgenic mice that make excess amounts of human adiponectin under, under its normal uh, promoter in a transgenic manner. And what we found using our um, uh, bleomycin model is that here is wild type mice. With bleomycin, they develop scleroderma. Here is the transgenic mice. They have too much adiponectin and they have a very abundant uh, dermal adipose layer, as you can see here. And with the induction of bleomycin fibrosis, they are at least partially protected. So even with high dose bleo, they retain at least some of the adipo, adipose layer in the dermis. And the protection from fibrosis in these mice is actually very strongly correlated with their level of adiponectin, uh, suggesting that it's really the high level of adiponectin that's protecting from fibrosis. Now, I mentioned that adiponectin cannot really be used as a drug. However, short peptides have been developed that engage the adiponectin receptor. Uh, these are very effective in mouse models. And in fact, some of these are now in clinical trials for a number of indicators. So these are 10 amino acid peptides that rapidly bind to and stimulate the adiponectin receptor on a, many different cell types. Now, in the last uh, couple of minutes, uh, I want to just switch gears and talk about the role of aging. <laughs> and this is Paul Clay, one of the great painters of the 20th century. Uh, 
and this is him and his wife, a pianist, in 1936. Uh, and around this time, Clay started to develop uh, a number of symptoms uh, that was ultimately diagnosed as scleroderma. And this is him about three years later, and he went on to die in the following year from his scleroderma complications. But one of the things that is striking, I think, and I see this in, in our clinic patients, is that they seem to age more rapidly. So made us wonder about whether scleroderma represents a form of accelerated aging. Now, uh, over the last decade, uh, these hallmarks of aging have been defined, and these are biological processes that seem to underlie uh, the, the biology of aging. And there's uh, uh, several of these identified. And interestingly, when we look at uh, patients with scleroderma, we find that they they display many of these uh, biologic hallmarks of aging, including deregulated nutrient sensing, sirtuin dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, telomere shortening, and a number of others. One of the hallmarks of, of aging in, in both animals and humans is this metabolic alteration that's associated with a decline in NAD levels. And so both humans and mice, as they age, drop NAD, and this seems to play a role in increasing frailty and some of the other complications of aging. Uh, this is just a table showing many of the mouse studies and now increasing number of human studies where uh, not only the loss of NAD has been documented, but its key role in driving some of the pathologies. Now, NAD has been known for a very, very long time and has been primarily studied for its role in redox reactions in the mitochondria. <clears throat> But over the last uh, two decades or so, it's also been increasingly recognized that NAD is also a critical coenzyme and cofactor, in particular for a number of enzymes that are involved in aging, such as the sirtuins and PARPs. And these enzymes really cannot do their job adequately if there is insufficient levels of NAD. So the NAD availability is a critical regulator of enzyme activity. Now, NAD is, is, is very tightly regulated, and normally it undergoes a constant recycling where NAD in, in the tissues and the cells is degraded by the enzyme CD38. This is both an endo and an ectoenzyme. Uh, that generates nicotinamide NAM, which is then normally recycled in the salvage pathway, and this really accounts for a, a lot of the NAD that you need for homeostasis. When there is a defect in any of these enzymes, various pathologies can ensue in a disruption of the NAD homeostasis. Now, we were interested in, in looking at the regulation of these enzymes in scleroderma, and we looked at the expression of uh, genes that are involved in either synthesizing or degrading NAD in the skin. And what we found, and as indicated here, is that many of the enzymes that are involved in NAD degradation were elevated in patients with scleroderma, skin biopsies, whereas enzymes that you need to regenerate NAD through the salvage pathway were not upregulated or actually downregulated. And this would be expected to lead to a state of NAD depletion. When we looked at large data sets, uh, multiple data sets of scleroderma biopsies, we were able to confirm upregulation of NAD. This is diffuse and limited scleroderma. This correlated fairly well with the skin score, so the severity of scleroderma, and correlated quite well with uh, TGF beta and PDGF signaling in these biopsies, suggesting that the high NAD levels might actually be directly contributing uh, to fibrosis. <clears throat> so to address this directly, uh, we took uh, mice that are lacking CD38 in all their cells, so CD38 knockout cells. And again, we did our bleomycin model. And what we found is that uh, in compared to the uh, wild type mice, the CD38 knockout mice were at least partially protected from dermal fibrosis. And again, we saw the same thing in the lung. These mice who have uh, 
uh, lack of uh, CD38 and elevated levels of NAD show a protection from skin and lung fibrosis. We then looked at a number of pharmacologic approaches to study the same issue. And I'll just skip ahead to say that pharmacologically inhibiting CD38 had the same effect of raising NAD levels and protecting from fibrosis. And that's shown here in the skin and the lung. And in fact, when mice have inhibition of CD38 and supplementing NAD, so combination therapy, they, are, they seem to be virtually completely protected from lung fibrosis. We then went on to do a, a slightly different strategy working with collaborators at Teneo Bio, a pharmaceutical a biotech company that developed a selective set of, of nanobodies that target CD38, but they're not cytolytic. They only block the ectoenzyme activity. <clears throat> and using these antibodies, again, we found a very similar situation where uh, blocking CD38 enzymatic activity led to an increase in NAD levels and a pretty substantial protection from lung fibrosis and skin fibrosis. And this was due to an increase in NAD levels and in fact, an increase in sirtuin activity so that the mice treated with the antibody had elevated SIRT1 and SIRT3 activity, which we think may be at least partially responsible from this protection from fibrosis. <clears throat> so we think aging and scleroderma and other processes lead to an increase in CD38 levels. This may be part of inflammation, which then leads to a decrease in NAD levels and a decrease in sirtuin activity. And this through a number of uh, epigenetic events leads to fibroblast senescence, fibroblast activation, frailty and fibrosis. And this seems to be actually impacted in many rheumatic diseases. And this is just a, a series of publications really in the last two, three years, indicating that upregulation of CD38 and altered NAD metabolism may be implicated in many diseases. One of them we're looking at is, is gout because uh, it seems to regulate the inflammasome as well. And as a corollary, it, it does suggest that by blocking CD38, either using small molecules, antibodies, or even just supplementation of nicotinamide and other precursors, we might be able to attenuate this process. Now, very interestingly, uh, one of the effects of CD38 and NAD depletion is actually to stimulate senescence in neighboring cell types. And that's shown here. These cells are now expressing beta-gal. And very importantly, these senescent cells will be secreting the so-called SASP, uh, a, a collection of rather inflammatory cytokines that can promote and propagate the process. Interestingly, we find that in scleroderma patients, there is an increase in cellular senescence. This is just looking at P16, which is one of the genetic markers, but is known to be quite nonspecific. So we've used more sophisticated techniques to demonstrate that scleroderma biopsies have increased levels of these senescent cells, and many of these are fibroblasts, as shown by co-staining with vimentin. Uh, even more potently, we can look at this at the single-cell RNA-seq level. And so we developed a senescent signature of about 30 genes that seem to be markers of senescent cells. And what we find, again, to spare you the detail, is that in scleroderma biopsies, virtually every cell type has very significant upregulation of the senescent signature. And in particular, we're very interested in the fibroblasts and the endothelial cells that show senescence. Very interestingly, uh, the, the senescent uh, signature score correlates with the uh, distribution of collagen producing cells and matrix producing cells. And in fact, there's a very strong correlation between the senescent score, these are individual cells, and the matrix score, strongly suggesting that the senescence actually is playing a role in fibrosis. Yeah. So senescence is a natural process. And as we get older, we start accumulating senescent cells uh, as part of aging, but other processes, including obesity, chemotherapy, chemotherapy, 
uh, and scleroderma and perhaps many others increases senescence burden and may contribute to a, a variety of pathologies. And so this has led to the idea that perhaps blocking or clearing senescent cells might have therapeutic benefit. And to study this in a pilot format, we did a very small pilot study using the satinib, which is a putative senolytic agent. And these patients were given uh, the satinib for 48 weeks. This was an open label study, so there's no control group. But what we did is we examined clinical outcomes and gene expression profile before and after therapy. And very interestingly, in this very small study, we found that in patients who were clinically responding, that is their skin score and their pulmonary function improved, actually showed a decrease in their skin senescence score as shown here. And individuals who did not seem to respond to the treatment, their senescence score did not budge. And in fact, the responders seemed to have a higher senescence score at entry into the study, suggesting that they might be more responsive to senolytic type of therapies. So <clears throat> I want to leave a few minutes for discussion, but just to wrap it up, I think while we're still lacking particularly effective treatments other than stem cell therapy, there are certainly very interesting ideas emerging uh, that might have a therapeutic implications. So we do have a number of drugs, but some of the potential emerging drugs could include drugs that disrupt these cellular circuits. And we know, for example, that targeting IL-6 <clears throat> does have some benefit. I mentioned that adipokine mimetics are in now clinical trial, although not for scleroderma yet. And similarly, uh, restoring NAD homeostasis by blocking CD38 and another enzyme that I didn't mention, NNMT, could have potential uh, benefit. These are not yet in clinical trials, but hopefully will be in the near future. A number of senotherapies, so senolytic therapies, but even what's called senomorphic therapies, uh, such as uh, JAK inhibitors, which could be thought of as senomorphic and number of epigenetic regulators that are currently actually in use for cancer might have potential utility. Now, importantly, uh, uh, Seattle was the birthplace of autologous hematopoietic stem cell for autoimmune diseases, and several small but robust studies show a very prolonged durable remission of patients treated with this treatment. Uh, potentially maybe even almost a cure. And this has led to a great deal of interest in other forms of cellular therapies, uh, and in particular CAR T therapies. Uh, the NIH is holding a workshop next month on looking at the variety of cellular and CAR T therapies as well as regulatory T cells to treat and maybe cure scleroderma. And I just want to end uh, by showing uh, my team uh, back at Northwestern and then more recently at University of Michigan and key collaborators, including Johan Gujansson and Dinesh Khanna, who have been key partners in this work. So um, I'm, I think I'm still on time. Happy to take any questions. Thanks uh, for a really, really fascinating uh, talk. I wonder if we have a Thanks. box with... Um... Questions there. Let's see. Yeah. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, here, okay. here would be Q and A. No open questions chat. Yeah, I don't see any. Um, it looks like there's no questions in the Q and A or chat. So this would be a perfect time to uh, pose your important questions. Maybe I'll uh, ask one in the in the meantime. Sure. Um, is the genetic basis for scleroderma, the, the GWAS studies, do they have an overlap with that of uh, idiop idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, telomeres are certainly involved there too. Yes, that's a great question. But surprisingly, perhaps they have no overlap at all. In fact, we looked at that very carefully. 
uh, we were interested in the MUC 5B, MUC 5B, which is the strongest genetic risk for IPF. And it's not at all found in, in and we did several studies not seen in patients with scleroderma lung disease. Uh, and conversely, a lot of these innate immune uh, genes that are commonly seen like TNF AIP3 are not seen in IPF. There's very prevalent overlap with other autoimmune diseases. So psoriasis, lupus, rheumatoid, uh, IBD, uh, but not with not with other fibrotic diseases. Would you mind reading and answering some uh, of those questions? Yeah, there? Mark. Mark asked. Thank you. Is expression of collagenate specific for scleroderma? Is it present in the lung? Uh, can it be used in diagnosis of lung biopsies? Well, I would say I know very little about collagenate at the moment. Uh, we did. Everywhere we look, we find it, including even in desmoplastic cancers. Um, and what's very, very interesting in collagen 8, it, it's a non-fibrillar collagen, but it's also a what's, what people call a matricryptin, which is that certain enzymes will cleave collagen 8 and generate a smaller molecule or peptide, which has been called vestatin, which itself has potent biologic activity on endothelial cells and others, although it's not known what is the receptor. So it seems quite possible that it's not the collagen 8 per se, but it's cleavage product that occurs extracellularly that could be biologically important. And it's something we're very, very interested in. Uh, there's another talk. Raynaud's is a unifying clinical feature for these patients. Might you comment on how this phenomenon plays in fibrosis. Um, uh, you know, <clears throat> microvascular injury is really very prevalent in scleroderma. It's basically present in every tissue one looks at. And what has been shown is that this leads to, you know, pervasive tissue hypoxia. And hypoxia itself is, is a definite well-known trigger for fibroblast activation. So uh, you know it, it's it's entirely possible or likely that the ischemia or hypoxia is is uh, you know contributing or am amplifying the fibrosis. Uh, Peter, hi Peter. Um, you mentioned that resident immune cells may be the most important aspect. Do your single cell or spatial transcriptome result suggest dysregulation normal resident memory T cells? Uh, very good question, and we have really not at all begun to look at uh, T cells and B cells, um, and we'd be happy to collaborate because there's a lot of data there to be mined, and we just have not looked at that. Uh, there's another question. Is there a role for interferon in activation differentiation of macrohistocytes over profibrotic? Uh, in terms of interferons, I mean, there is very likely a role. There is certainly an interferon signature. It's not as prominent as it is in lupus or, or myositis. There is a clinical trial of blocking interferon in scleroderma. Very interestingly, though, uh, pipe 2 interferon is, is an extremely potent antifibrotic. So it really blocks all the TGF stimulatory effects. Uh, and and so type 2 interferon is probably an important negative regulator of fibroblast activation. Um, and in terms of NAD, uh, interferon, I think type 1, actually type 2 interferon is a potent inducer of CD38. So that will lead to NAD depletion. So you have different different uh, different activities going on here. In one in one sense, directly inhibiting fibroblast uh, at the same time, maybe causing NAD depletion. So I think it's very hard to predict what the effect of blocking interferons will be. There were clinical trials of of actually giving interferon gamma as a treatment in scleroderma, and they led to a lot of toxicity, and they were they were abandoned. So let's see if there's any other. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Jane is asking, is, is tenacin citrullinated? 
Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, Kim Midwood has looked at this in, in rheumatoid arthritis where it is citrullinated. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's looked at that, but it would be very, very interesting. Uh, and Keith asked, do you see collagen 8 in mouse models? Uh, and yes, we do. Uh, Kimberly asked, is adiponectin found throughout the body system, including the lung? Yes, it is. And, and, and the, uh, the, the uh, adiponectin knockout mice has been studied in lung models, and, and I believe they show worse, uh, um, at least pulmonary hypertension, and maybe worse lung fibrosis. Um, there's a question on CD38 is a marker for plasma cells. In scleroderma, what cells express CD38? Um, Anti-CD30 is already approved for treatment of multiple myeloma. So you're absolutely correct. Um, in, in scleroderma, we actually see rather low level of CD38 in fibroblasts, and it is in the plasma cells. Um, but daratizumab is really a cytolytic drug. It basically kills cells that are CD38 positive. And what we're hoping to do is really not kill the cells, but block the ectoenzyme activity. So it's a non-cytolytic sort of metabolic approach. Whether daratizumab would be effective in scleroderma, I don't know. Uh, my colleague Jason Knight is currently doing a study of daratizumab in lupus. So that might, and hopefully we'll be able to look at the NAD metabolism in those patients. Um, have you looked at skin biopsies in children with SSC and morphia, our genetics and cell signature? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we, have, we have not. Uh, Dr. Cassie Torok at Pittsburgh uh, and Heidi Jacoby have been publishing a number of these studies, and it'll be very interesting to, to compare the adult and the, and, the, and the children. Could you show the prior slide with the upcoming therapies? Could I show that? Yes. Let's see. Um, the, these are, I would say, therapies that are maybe more on the horizon. Uh, they really, I don't think any of them, other than CAR T and stem cell therapy, are currently in clinical trials. But hopefully, at least some of them will be. I hope that that answers your question. Um, I think we are probably so much over time that okay. we should uh, stop here, and people can approach you with uh, questions later on, and of course tonight. So. I I hope sure. uh, everybody in the audience plans to come tonight and and, and hear more uh, from John as well as uh, some other presentations and the hors d'oeuvres afterwards. So thank you, everybody. And thank you, uh, Dr. Varga. Thank you.